Welcome to the Aussie Firebug Podcast, the financial independence podcast for Australians. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Aussie Firebug Podcast, the financial independence podcast for Australians where I interview clever people who have already reached or are on their way to financial independence. Our guest today is Dave, aka Strong Money Australia. Dave reached financial independence at the ripe old age of just 28. Dave is originally from country Victoria, but moved to Western Australia at 18 to take advantage of the mining boom. Roughly two years into a job, Dave got a new boss and suddenly going to work each day was a bit of a struggle. He discovered investing and financial independence shortly after, and after eight more years of work, eight investment properties, and a lot of stocks later, discovered he had reached financial independence. We chat about Dave's early years at work, questioning to the nine to five day grind for the next 50 years, investing and much more in the podcast. Let's get into it. Why don't you uh, just start off with a little bit about yourself, mate? Yeah, so my name's Dave and I'm originally from country Victoria, but I moved to Perth when I was 18 years old and then I worked as a... Uh, factory worker basically in a, in a sheet metal factory and then as a, a forklift driver and a storeman at a, at a dairy factory for roughly the last uh the first the first job was for roughly two years and then the uh, second job was for roughly about eight years and i now live in perth with my uh long-time girlfriend and my dog oh cool and uh so you're you're 28 is that right yep just yeah. about to turn 29 yep about to turn 29. And um, so you left uh, country Victoria um, yeah, roughly 10 years ago, did you say? Yeah, yeah, just just after I turned 18, basically. Just, yeah, so what made you decide to pack up shop and head over to the other side of the country? Yeah, well, I was 18 and I needed a job, basically, and country Victoria was pretty quiet on the jobs front, especially where I'm from. So there wasn't much happening there. And I had a couple of mates actually came over to Perth about probably six months prior and then uh, they were telling me how many jobs were available at that time because this is, this is basically the middle of the mining boom back then so there was just jobs jobs for anyone who wanted them so I thought if I'm going to going to uh, have a better life I probably need to go somewhere where there's a decent job so that's why I decided to move. You're right. And what was that like heading over there at such a, you know, relatively young age, 18 year old bloke heading off with a few friends? Would have been a bit of fun. Yeah. So it kind of happened quite fast. I started, so when my mate told me how many jobs there were, I started Googling jobs online and started finding like just, uh, you know, your average labourer jobs paying 20, you know, $20 an hour or something in a, in, in a factory. And I thought, yeah, I could probably do that for 40 hours a week and that's uh, pretty decent money where I'm from and, and back then. So I, I didn't really think too much about it. It was basically I could stay in, in country Victoria and not have a job or I could move to Perth and start making some some half-decent money that would hopefully get me somewhere. And so me and one other mate just decided to, to pack up and drive across. And uh, actually, actually, when I got here, I had $800 in my bank account. So I didn't really plan ahead too much, but I just figured that there was that many jobs that it would it would probably work out all right. Well, eighteen hundred uh, eight hundred dollars in your bank account. Um, eight, yeah, eight hundred dollars. Yeah, incredible. Now I'm gonna I was gonna talk about this a bit later, but we might as well um, just bring it up now. So on your mm-hmm. site, you've got that you you've reached financial independence um, at the age of twenty eight. Um, can you just talk a bit about uh, how you, so you got this job, you went over there, you got this job, $800 to your name, like no other investments or anything prior to that? No, nah, nothing at all. Just so, just, that, just, just my, my whopping savings there. <laughs> so $800. Um, so how do you get from 18 years of age with $800 to um, financially independent at 28? Can you just walk us through the steps of um, you know, discovering, investing and stuff like that and what, what led you to save so much money? Yeah, so I've always been probably more of a saver than a spender and as soon as I got here, I, I did end up getting a job within about, I think it was within about 10 days or so, so my uh, my savings didn't go down too much from $800. So then uh, it was just a case of I was, 
I was renting with a friend and it wasn't really costing me too much. So even out of my $20 an hour wage, I managed to to save a reasonable amount. And then we, we ended up moving into a bigger house, but with uh, with more people, which sort of made the rent cheaper when it averaged out and I was able to save a bit more. And then uh, that job had a, had a decent amount of overtime attached, so I started taking up a fair bit of overtime and started building up my savings and Back then, you could get maybe, I don't know, like 5% or maybe even 6% in your high-interest savings account. So I thought uh, what I was doing all right there. So I did that for a couple of years. And I started thinking that uh, I'm going to have to learn about investing or something because uh, this savings account is pretty cool, but it's probably not going not gonna to make me rich, you know. So I started uh, researching about investing. And I think initially, I actually Googled how to get rich, basically, because I was so getting a bit uh bit depressed looking around at all these all these older guys at my work and they they were just sort of plodding along and they didn't really look happy and they just just working every week to pay their bills and it just didn't didn't seem like the uh didn't seem like that that was for me you know so I wanted something different you didn't you didn't want to end so up then, like them no i didn't i didn't want to end up like that it just seemed like such a such a limited life with no choices you're basically just working to survive and you never question anything and you just you just keep doing the same thing every week and it didn't seem like it was for me and how many years into the job was did these thoughts start creeping into your head probably actually it was probably around about two years into it so i was maybe oh maybe a year and a half so i was maybe 19 and a half and we actually got a we actually got a different boss at that workplace. It was it was fine until we got we got this different boss and he was just he was just a nightmare. So I just thought, like, man, why do people put up with this and why do you I just started questioning everything. Why do people just work forever with for a shit boss they don't like and I don't know, it just just didn't appeal to me the regular work forever lifestyle and to get nowhere. So I thought that I had to do something different. To, yeah. to end up with a different result. Absolutely. I'm definitely hearing you. I think a lot of people go through a similar thing. Um, you know, it's good that if, if you like your job and that's awesome, but, um, you know, all it takes is management to change or a different boss or a coworker that you don't particularly get along with and all of a sudden, you know, your great job can turn into a bit of a nightmare. Um, a similar thing happened to me just towards the end of my job. It was a great job. My uh, I changed jobs at the end of last year, at the start of last year, and my old job mm-hmm. was fantastic. But then management changed, and it just it wasn't as good anymore. And I didn't really want to come to work um, to do my job anymore. And um, you know, I had the the option of, um, well, I had the opportunity that I took, but um, I had a, a strong savings, and I wasn't locked into that uh, that job, which a few people were. They had to rely on that job to you know pay the bills mm-hmm. and stuff. But I could um, you know sort of switch jobs and take a bit of a pay cut and still manage so that's see that's the thing it gives you gives you that flexibility doesn't it you know yeah ab- absolutely so even if you even if you love your job today who's to say like next year you, you won't wake up and uh all, all of a sudden realize you, you don't actually love it that much you're just doing it for the money and then you get a different boss and it just just becomes not very enjoyable anymore for sure for sure so you get this new boss and then everything changes yeah, basically I started, I just started, stopped enjoying work really. So I didn't want to be there anymore. I just, I, I even stopped doing overtime. So I just, I just did not want to be there. Yeah. And then it got to the point where, um, they actually called me in and my attitude was so bad that they basically said, we know you don't want to be here and it's got to the stage where we don't really want you here. So, maybe we should just part ways and I said yeah that's probably a good idea so that was my last day at work for, oh, for wow. that job and that was two yeah. two years in in WA or roughly two years in uh yeah I think it was, it was probably yeah almost two years about a year and a half almost two years okay and have you got so you're, you're googling how to get rich are you have you discovered you know investing in financial independence at this stage or you're just sort of um on the the cusp of that yeah, so I didn't really know it was a thing back then. I was just sort of Googling just how, how do rich people actually get rich, you know, and it come up sort of 
the Google results come up with the yep. old the old favorites of property and and shares, you know. Yep. So I thought, well, shares are a bit uh, a bit scary. What with the market crashes and the fluctuations, that don't really make much sense. So I thought, well, when when I get another job and start saving, I'm going to get into property, and that's that's how I'm. That's how I was planning to get rich. The Australian dream. Yeah, the Aussie dream, mate. The Aussie dream. Yeah. <laughs> so you get this, you get this new job, and um, yep, so I, so I got a new job, and uh, it actually, to my surprise, pays better than the old job. So I was pleasantly surprised there. It's a win. And actually, I'll just go. Actually, I'll just go back a bit. Just before I got this this next job, I actually took maybe three months off. And lived on my savings over the summer because yep. we were living in a we were living in a beach house in uh, on a in a coastal suburb over here. Just me and maybe I think it was about four or five other blokes. Yep. So I had I had these savings built up, and I thought well, I actually don't have to get a job straight away. So I might just you know enjoy the summer while I'm here, just in this beach house because we might not be here next year, and then I'll uh, I'll get a job after that. So I had a bit of a taste of what it's like to have some money and not have to work, and I thought it was just the best thing ever, really. And I thought oh, I've got to have me some more of that. <laughs> Look, that that's, <laughs> it sounds good. I could just imagine a young bloke with his mates uh, in uh, in WA enjoying the summer without working, living off living off some money. Yeah, I, I could see how that'd be nice. Oh, well, it was amazing. It was just a bit of a taste at what it would be like to be rich, you know? Yeah, for sure. Because we sure. actually. So we actually continue. lived in we actually we actually lived in basic it was like a run like a run down mansion basically in a, in a coastal suburb here and it was because it was so run down it was quite cheap to rent it especially between uh, five blokes so we were living in like a pretty pretty fancy area right across from the water and that and it was just it was pretty cheap but we loved it and it was just it was just awesome awesome <laughs> summer off really and a bit yeah. of a bit of a taste at what I wanted in the future, you know. A, few, just that a, freedom. a, few, a few parties were had at that place, no doubt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, so that did that light a fire under your belly to, to really get back stuck into to the workforce, earn some money and, you know, reach the goal? Yeah, it really, it really did. I, I probably haven't thought about it that much, but I think it did. It just it just showed me that what, what savings can do, you know. If you've got savings in the bank, you don't actually – you actually have a choice then. You don't have to just work every week forever with no end in sight. You actually can choose to spend your time differently. Yep, for sure. Couldn't couldn't agree anymore. It's and it also mm. it's, it's it's good for your your mental state at work anyway. If you know the back of your mind, well, actually, like even now, I'm not financially independent, but shit, I could take you know ten years off. I reckon I could live off you know what we've got. At the moment, yeah. so um, in the back of my mind, I've always got that, you know, it will really, if I really wanted to, I could just scale it back to two days a week at, you know, odd jobs and, and live for a, a, a decent while without having to go back to work, um, even if it's just a, a year or so just to, to recharge the batteries, I've always got that option. But I'm really liking my current job at the moment, so that's, uh, you know, not something I'm going to do, but it's it's very healthy to know that you've got that option. Yeah, it's like a bit of extra extra comfort there, you know. You've got that you've got that flexibility, and you know that if if you get too frustrated, that there is actually a way out, and you, you don't have to, you know, put up with certain things. And it's just it's just a different way to live mentally, isn't it? For sure, for sure, it's very very underrated. A lot of people, you know, sort of say, well, you know, you get to financial independence, and maybe I I don't I don't want to stop working, and that's that's perfectly cool, but um. You know, you'll find a lot of people say that they get to financial independence and sometimes their job becomes even more meaningful. You know, it's the same job, but once they, they have that, um, yeah, they reach that number, um, suddenly they enjoy work more, which is a weird side effect. But yeah, a lot of people say yeah. that it happens. It's funny, isn't it? Because it's the same job, but the point is they get to choose to go to that job. They don't actually have to anymore. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Very, very important uh, mindset shift. It's- it's pretty subtle, but it's pretty powerful at the same time. Yeah, right. So, how long were you in this second job for? Uh, so, I was in that second job up until uh, basically up until last year. 
I worked there for I think it was roughly eight years or just oh. a bit. Yeah, roughly eight years. Nice, nice. And it was a uh, similar sort of work, like in the warehouse, or was it? Or it was a warehouse, but it was uh, it was a milk factory, so it was a refrigerated warehouse. That so was a bit, bit more pleasant in the Perth summers. Oh, nice to go to work to go to work in a refrigerated warehouse. So that was actually it was pretty good in summer. Yeah, cool, cool. So, what happened during those eight years? So, you you, you had your your great summer, and you got stuck into work for the next eight years. You just want to walk us yep. through what happened. So, I was, I think I was just about twenty when I got this job, and it paid paid a decent bit better than the last job, and there was a fair bit of overtime as well. So I was. I started getting all motivated about saving, and I, I had a little bit of savings left from my from my time off, so I wanted to add to it, you know. So I started doing lots more, uh, lots more hours at this job, and started building up the saving, and started started reading about property since I decided that that was what I was going to do. And then it was basically a case of just keep learning about how I'm going to. How I'm going to buy, be able to buy enough properties to retire and build up the savings as fast as I can by just hardcore saving and being super frugal and try and build up those, uh, those deposits so I can buy properties. So I ended up being able to save a fair bit. I think maybe, I can't remember the numbers, man. It was maybe like 60, 70 grand when I was, Turning 22, and I bought my first property with that one. Nice. And then in the next 12 months after that, I ended up buying another property with with more savings that I did. I ended up just doing so much overtime. I, just, I didn't have much free time. I just wanted to save, save, save. So I ended up buying another one when I was um, 23, and at that point I'd met and moved in with my partner at the moment when I was around, probably we, we think we met and moved in when I was about 20, 20, yeah, about 20. And so our finances were separate at that point, but uh, she, she bought a property as well around the same time that I bought mine and she had a fair bit of equity in her house because she's a, she's a fair bit older than me. So she had, she'd had a home for, for quite a while and, and, and paid a lot off. So she ended up tapping into that equity to buy uh, to buy her investment property. And then we sort of teamed up properly and joined all our finances together and it made it, it sort of made it a lot easier to save because we we're on the same page and we wanted the same goals. And so we just knuckled down and, and started planning together. If we have equity in, in this property and some equity over in this property and we combine it with our cash savings and we can buy another one and we just sort of snowballed it from there, I guess, just with a combination of of savings and some equity in the properties that had grown a bit in value. And quite back then it was sort of easy to borrow a lot of money, not, not so much nowadays, but, but back then it was. So that really helped us. Uh, being able to build that portfolio in a in a fairly short amount of time, so that was quite handy. And uh, so then it got to the point where I think we were, I was around about twenty five, twenty six, and the equ- our equity was was building a bit. We were still had um, still had a fair bit of savings each year, even after paying for the properties because they were. They were mostly negative cash flow capital city properties in Australia. So as you probably know, the rent doesn't, doesn't cover the bills. So you got to put your hand in your pocket. So we still had savings after paying for those. And that's when the finance, uh, started to become harder to get, harder to get loans and the, the regulators sort of started clamping down on, on loose lending. So it became quite hard. To to borrow and we'd basically maxed out at that stage and borrowed as much as we possibly could. So we ended up with savings that we weren't sure what to do with because we we didn't really want to pay down debt because we thought we could get a better return investing rather than paying down debt. So I actually started looking into where else we could put our money and 
Well, I was pretty hesitant at shares for a while, and that's why I ended up choosing property. I started to do a bit more research. I ended up coming off across this approach that's basically investing in shares, but instead of focusing on the prices, you focus on the dividends. And I thought that that made quite a lot of sense since the share price fluctuations to me didn't, didn't seem to make a lot of sense and didn't seem all that reliable to, um, to base a, an investment strategy on. So we started buying uh, shares that were dividend-focused and we found out about um, education material like Peter Thornhill's book, which is Motivated Money. And his, the video is on his website, which, uh, which helped us quite a lot in understanding basically just how the share market works and, and why you should focus on the income and not so much on the share prices. And it, it, it just really put things together for me and it just took away that, took away that fear that I had about shares. Cause like a, a lot of property people, I was, I was pretty, pretty afraid of the, uh, of the share market. I didn't think it made a whole lot of sense. And so I went to, to property in the first place. But we started investing our savings in these dividend paying shares like, uh, listed investment companies and some other dividend stocks. And we started getting these dividend checks and we quite liked it and we thought, well, this is actually pretty easy. You just put your savings in, get a dividend check. You can reinvest the dividend or you can do what you want with it. So it, may, it, it just gave us something more concrete where we were getting these regular returns, we didn't have to worry too much about the market went up or the market went down. So we started um, focusing more on that. And around this time, we... I've gone blank for a bit, mate. Yeah, that's all right. So, wow, well, so, <laughs> so much to get through. So, I sort of just let you oh. let you go on because it, it was such a, you know, it, it was it was really good what, what you were saying. So, I'll just let you go. But um, a few <laughs> things I want to touch on. Um, yeah. So, yeah. first first question is actually, how did you meet your girlfriend if you're doing all this overtime? Uh, I think I met her. Jesus, that's a good question. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was a long time ago. Right? Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> I think, well, I was about 20. I think we just met. I think she was out, she was out for a night out with her, one of her friends for her birthday and I was out for my mate's birthday and we just sort of met out, you know, and just got along really well and just went from there. She, she might have come, <laughs> yeah, to, come to a party at the yeah, mansion, the rundown mansion. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I think it was, I think it was at a pub actually. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. Right. So, so you, you work in these, um, now that is, you know, what a story. Um, basically eight solid years and oh, I can relate to it so much. You know, you being born in Australia, if you want to make money, it's pretty much property is shoved down your throat in every direction. Um, with your parents, your uncles, your aunts, your grandparents, yeah. uh, the media, everything is all property, property, property. But, yeah. um, as I discovered as well, um, the share market is awesome. They're both really good assets, um, mm. asset classes to be honest, but, um, yeah, like it depends what you want to do and how you want to do it, but they both got their merits. Now, you you guys started buying property in capital cities, did you say? Was it like what, yeah. Sydney, Sydney, Melbourne yeah. area? Uh, well, in Perth to start with because, yep. you know, that's our city, so everyone buys in their own city first. Yep. And then, so we've got quite a few here, which haven't actually done much for us, to be honest. But <laughs> yeah, when <laughs> because you, when you say quite a few, how, how much are we talking here? Uh, we have four here. Four in Perth, okay. Now, yeah, yeah. That you've still got those. Yes, we do. Yeah, one yeah. was our house, which we're which is rented out now because we're yeah. we're renting ourselves. Yeah. And so, and f- we had two in Melbourne, one in Sydney, and one in Brisbane. Wow. So what's and my my math is what seven? Is that right? Uh, seven and our own house, so eight altogether. Wow, eight eight properties, incredible. Now, so you you kept you bought you did you buy the first four in Perth to start with, and then you ventured outside the state. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's now, right. What, that's what made you out invest outside the state? Because when you were buying in Perth, it would have been peak of the mining boom. I'm I'm assuming so the the yield would have been pretty good. So yeah, so the the rental. So I think the first property I bought was actually the first two I bought were actually 
positive cash flow because the, the rental returns are actually quite good back then. I think it was around 2011. Yep. So the rental returns were pretty good back then. Um, not so much nowadays. Yep. So that didn't cost me too much. So I was able to save up the next deposit actually quite easily. Yep. Since it wasn't costing me anything for the, yeah. So what made you go to Melbourne and Sydney? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, it was basically just a diversification thing. So we, if, if, uh, if Perth struggled for a while, which it ended up doing, then we'd have properties in other cities that would hopefully have, have grown in value. So we could, uh, harvest the equity from there to, to continue buying. Yep. That was basically the idea behind it. Not having all, all your, all your properties in the one place sort of gives you more optionality and a bit of diversification as well. Yep. Yep. Great. So you, you, did you end up with the, um, the eighth investment property before you went to shares? Like once you went shares, was then no going back or did you dabble in shares and then still bought investment properties along the way? No, actually, after we bought, we basically started buying shares straight after we bought the last investment property. Which was what year? Um, uh, that was at 2015, I think it was. Yeah, right. 2015. That's, I can, and, you know, I was, we're similar age and, um, I can definitely, um, like relate to the lending restrictions and everything like that. You know, back in <laughs> the early, um, uh, teens, whatever you want, teenies, whatever they call the 2010s to 20s. Um, yeah, it yeah. was, yeah, you could, Get a loan, or more more importantly, you could withdraw equity so ridiculously easy. I did it um three times with my three investment properties. Um, when they went up in value, like I did the twenty percent mm-hmm. deposit, it went under eighty percent um loan to value ratio, and then I just top up to eighty, yeah. and it was literally an email to my mortgage broker saying, "Hey, like Commonwealth Bank, think it's worth this much. This is the loan. Can you like get out the extra twenty grand?" And like literally. Uh, two weeks later, it'd be in my account. Like, well, that was easy. It didn't cost me anything. Like, it was just, um, yeah, it was so much easier. That, that was, so, yeah, yeah go that ahead. was, that was sort of bending over backwards back then, weren't they? Yeah, I know. And my last, the last time I went to do it, like, it was just so much more difficult. And I just, I don't even bother to do it now. Like, um, at the <laughs> moment, it's just, yeah, re- really hard. Um, uh, but you gotta, you gotta make the most of it when you can get it right. Like, that was an opportunity. Back then, yeah, you, you did, and you, you you got all these properties, and you used that to your advantage. Um, and you know, look at the position you're in now. Yeah, so we didn't actually know that. Obviously, we didn't know that the uh, that the finance arena was going to get a lot tougher. We just basically stuck to our strategy, and <laughs> which was borrowing as much as we could. Yep. And uh, luckily, it tend to to work out more times than not. But um, yeah, I don't think anyone was, was sort of guessing that this was going to happen and that it was a short time. People just assume that that's the way it is and you can, you're always going to be able to borrow what you need if you've got a decent income and you've got some equity. The banks will sort of maybe bend the rules a bit and, mm. if you, and, uh, yeah, help you out. I always like when I was crunching the numbers, you know, as long as you could, as long as the cash flow was strong, I wasn't, um, afraid to loan, you know, money to buy properties. Like a lot of people said, oh, you've got your third property now and, you know, all this money in debt. Well, I had, I've got, um, my parents and, you know, uncles and aunties that, um, run businesses and, you know, we're talking millions of dollars they've got to, um, juggle. So, um, it, I sort of was brought up with, um, there's good debt and there's bad debt. Um, mm, so that yeah, wasn't yeah. a scare, like a scary thing for me to, to, to do. And I, if the numbers worked, and I would figure out, you know, this is how much um, the property uh, gets from rent. This is how much it's going to cost. Factor in a 2% um, increase in um, interest. Or I'm going to go for it. If the numbers make sense, I'm just going to go for it. Um, and luckily, the, the lending, uh, yeah, um, the, the, the lending, uh, the bank's lending in Australia at that time allowed me to do so. But I think if I started again today, I wouldn't be able to do that, like to get three um with yeah, t- with yeah. today's restrictions, there's no way I could. And like that really, um, my gains from 2012, I first built to last one I bought in 2015 really has like amplified, um, my net worth in the last couple of years. So, you know, you, you just got to make most of it when it's yeah, available. Yeah, that's spot on. I mean, a lot of people, 
yeah, a lot of people are afraid of debt. And uh, I just figured that if, if you're going to make a total return that's much higher than than the, the interest payments, then it, it sort of makes sense, you know. Mm. If you've got plenty of extra cash from your job or, or from the asset itself, then even if interest rates go up, you're, you're going to be fine. And as long as those those assets have half decent returns over time, you're probably going to come out ahead. Yeah. And like, I, it's, you know, it cuts both ways, right? Like if you, if you leverage, um, an investment and it does well, it's amplified. And then if it does poorly, that's amplified as well. But I think it's just about being smart with the, um, the cash flow is what I always look at it with, you know, when I'm, yeah, pe- people ask me about properties. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, if, as long as it's got strong cash flow, then I don't care if it halves in value. If Australia goes through a recession and it goes down half price, as long as the rent doesn't go down half, then, you know, I can absorb, um, you know, 20, 20, 30% rental loss across the three plus an interest rate and still be, I can still hold, you know, through that downturn. Um, you know, and yeah. can, if you're crunching the numbers with your investment properties, can you do that? Cause that's something that you need to consider. It's not so much how much it's worth. It's all about how much it's bringing in. That's how I look at, at it anyway. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a smart way to look at it. Our um, our strategy was more buying uh, the bit like the best located properties that we could afford to uh, to hold. And there was definitely some luck involved. You know, I mean, if if Australia did have a recession in the last few years, and and those properties did drop in value, we probably wouldn't be retired today because you know if the if the value is going to be less than than the loan. That we have against it, we're not going to be able to sell it and, and put the money into shares. So there was definitely some luck involved there. For sure, for sure. No question. So, so you discover shares, and that's um, wh- what year was that? 2015, were you saying? You bought your yeah, first that shares. Yeah, that was in 2015. Yep. And um, now, who I'm going to put a link in the show notes. Um, Peter Thornhill was it? Yeah. So what's he? I actually Peter haven't, Thornhill. haven't heard so about got... him. What's who, what's okay. what's his story? Really? So he's a so, so he's a but he's a bloke who's in his, I think he's in his, might be 70 by now, but he's a, he's an ex, ex finance guy. He used to work for fund managers back in, um, the, the 80s and 90s. And so he knows what goes on in the, in the share market space. And so he decided, after he retired, decided to become an educator. And he, he, he runs courses actually in, uh, Sydney and I think sometimes in Melbourne for, it's like a one-day training course of how the the average investor should approach the share market, and it's not about selling things to you. It's just about it's just about pure that fundamental education of how the share market works, what you should focus on, what you should ignore. And he's got he's got a few videos on his website that basically explain the same thing, and uh, they just really helped me in, in cutting through the rubbish that you see basically spoken about in the media about this the share market nonsense that goes on and he, he just explains it in these simple terms that even a that even a beginner and a and a property guy can understand and it just makes a lot of sense and it just just took away that fear of the unknown of the share market for me and just gave me something to um something to focus on that that really struck a chord with me is is, is the income of of shares Yep. Just made a lot of sense. Yeah, right. So this guy really helped you out, you know, understand um, what the share market is, what you should focus on. And then um, I'm going to put a few links in the show notes as well too because you got some really good articles about um, your thoughts on dividend investing and um, listed investment companies. And we'll go into them in a second. Uh, but mm-hmm. so just to stay on track with the the timeline here, so you, you, you listen to this guy, Peter, and you start investing in what in the share market back in 2015? Uh, listed invested the companies mainly. Yep. So you're after that. And you're after that di- dividend, some dividend focus. stocks as well. Yeah, exactly. And um, I liked you. I liked how you said before as well. Um, how you, you get the dividend, you buy this. You basically just dump your money in this thing, which is the share market, and then it spits out some money at you. And you think, wow, this is good. I didn't really do anything, you know, because I, I got the the same feeling when I first got my my first dividend. Like, wow, I didn't do anything. Like, I didn't have to manage anything. Yeah. I didn't have to do like jack all, and it just it just popped out. Um, it is a magical feeling, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think that's why there's such a uh, such 
such a such a love for, for many people have for dividends because it's just it, it sort of feels like easy money, you know. Yeah. I mean, the company could retain it and and invest it, but just to get that that check in the mail or that deposit into the bank, which you can you, you've exerted basically no effort for, you, you, there's no headaches, no property managers, there's yeah. no bills associated with it. You just collect it and go, or you can reinvest it back in, and it's just extremely easy. Yep. And so you fall in love with um, investing in the share market. Is that fair to say? I think that's I think that's fair to say. And what happens then? So <laughs> your strategy is shifted, is it, from buying properties to everything in the share market? And just talk us through a bit about like, did you sell down a few properties or you, you still got all of them? How did that go? Yeah. So it was a few things happened at once in that in that time around 2015. The, the finance space was changing. There was absolutely no way we could even have borrowed the amount that we had borrowed at that stage, let alone get any more. So that was part of the reason for the shift to, um, to shares. And then our growing, growing knowledge on the share market and of, of dividend investing really helped us see what kind of an income that we could create with shares. And because of the lack of expenses really associated with that and the franking credits in Australia, the income that you that you can get from shares is actually very very high here, compared to especially compared to capital city property. So it became kind of obvious that well, we're not going to be able to just um, draw down some equity and because because originally our plan was to have this big portfolio and we could just draw down a little bit of equity each year to to live on, which was uh, sort of doable back 10, 10 15 years ago, but uh, it wouldn't be doable today, so we started realizing that that was that was not going to happen. So even if we decided to sell up and just have a couple of mortgage-free properties, because they were capital city based, there was you're only going to be left with a yield of maybe three percent if you're lucky. So your million dollars might might get you thirty grand after expenses, but that million dollars in Aussie shares might get you say. 55 grand or, or something like that of, of income. So it became pretty obvious that we're going to have to change. We're going to have to, uh, basically just change our direction and, and switch assets and just put more money into, into shares while we, while we take our money selectively out of, out of properties. Yeah, not over time. Nice. And it's so funny because I went through a very similar mindset. You know, I was all on the, the property, you know, same thing. I wanted to own, you know, 20 <laughs> properties and um, pay off 10 yeah, yeah. and just be like a, this, you know, multi-millionaire property um, guru. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, same thing. I the, the, the income didn't – it just seemed like it was – properties are a good wealth builder at the start of your journey because it can mm-hmm. amplify the – Capital gains can definitely be amplified by um, leveraging the investment. Um, but I just, the more we, once we first had a go at investing in the, the, the stock market, the share market, and we got those dividends and stuff like that, I just, the more I thought about it, you know, with the headaches with property, I thought um, they've served me well, like they, they've had great gains so far. Um, there's no shame. And I think this is a mindset thing for um, people, which I always find funny. Some people always either real like pro property and they don't like they hate the share market and pro or pro share market and they hate property but like you can do both right like they're both great yeah, asset classes yeah. so why not leverage both so um you know we we have shifted now you know from the property mindset to more the share market but that does, that's not to say that the properties haven't done great they've been our best performers um in our portfolio but moving forward and if we want to retire early it makes more sense having that um, uh, passive income that the share market um, helps you with. So totally understand where you're coming from. And it's it's good that you realize that, you know, eight properties deep, some people might think that your mind was made up, like that was where you were going to go. So mm. it, it takes a, a big person to sort of, ad- not admit, but like switch strategies to say, well, no, first the, our first one isn't going to get us where we want to be and now I'm going to do this. So kudos. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if the information that you've got changes, then you should change your mind. You don't just keep going on something just because you've been doing it all along. It doesn't make much sense to me, you know? Yeah, for sure. 
So start, yeah, so it started becoming obvious that we were, we were going to need to change. So rather than just ignore the information that we had, we decided to uh, just sort of swallow our pride and, and change course. But uh, it's funny you say about you, you wanted to have like 20 properties and be a multi-millionaire. They don't tell you about the headaches in the magazines, do they? They just tell you about, oh, you know, you just uh, you just borrow some money, you just collect these properties, and then in uh, five, ten years you're like super rich and you don't have to work anymore, and there's no <laughs> headaches, and it's uh, yeah, it's all easy, it's all smooth. Sailing. It's a small, it's a small job, but, and I've only got three. I could only imagine what eight, the amount of you know, like extra work you have to do for eight. No, but but do you manage them yourself? No, I don't. But like, even then, the accounting and stuff that goes into it, and like the you know, the emails, yeah. like it's, it's a tight. Like you know, there's there's definitely management involved. There's work involved. Yeah, exactly. Um, another thing was uh, of how you were saying about some people pro property and pro shares. It's funny because now that I've I've been talking to quite a few shares guys and quite a few guys who are doing both. I've noticed that a lot of the shares converts used to invest in property, but when I was investing in property, I hadn't met anyone who had switched from shares. And I was just, I started thinking lately, I think it's just the ease of use and the, the simplified approach that you were talking about earlier, how you just, you know, you just cut, you just get this cash payment and you're like, wow, that was easy. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> Yeah. So and so, even if uh, people decide that they're, even if they get lower returns, they don't mind because it's so much easier or, or whatever. You know that they're just you get to that point where you, you're not really interested in leverage anymore, and you just want a simplified approach. You just want this this um, cool, easy income stream that's coming in. Yeah, for sure. I think it's it's it seems to be the natural progression for. Uh, a lot of people, especially in the, the fire community, um, to start off with property. And it, I think it's a good asset class if you're, especially if you're like a chippy or like some sort of tradie that you can put your skills into the investment. Um, that is a mm. real plus that you can't really do with shares. Like you can't really add value to shares, but there's a lot of different ways you can add value to property. So if you've got the time and energy and like you don't have commitments when you're young, I think you can really boost and leapfrog your um your portfolio in the early years but then as you move to to be older <laughs> like we are um <laughs> the, the 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 um passive income of shares becomes a lot more attractive um so you know i think that that yeah. may explain a little bit why it is more of a natural shift from property to shares yeah, I think you're spot on there. I mean, someone's a builder, they can, they can obviously add a lot of value and add very little cost to them, you know, because of their contacts and skills and supplies and whatever. So I think that's a good point that you make. But for the, for the average Joe, there's, um, I can't remember what I was going to say there. Uh, I think it was, yeah, but, the, the passive income is just a lot more attractive, right? For your, for your average, show, yeah, 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 exactly. So, um, it's just super simplified. There's just nothing to do, you know. You just, it's just, like, it's almost like a savings account, you know. You, you just sweep, you just sweep your money away from one account to the other, buy parcel of shares, and and uh, go back to work or go back to the beach or whatever you were doing before. Yeah, totally. And the best thing, the best thing about the index style investment, which you know you invest in, um. Uh, listed investment companies, which also follow, it's slightly managed, but it's not, it's a sim, you know, similar index style, yeah. um, investing. Very, very similar. Yeah, very similar. It's, you don't have to, there's no research to be done. That's what I love about, um, passive investing. There's no, you don't have to study any books. You don't have to, um, read anything. You don't have to be watching certain stocks. It's just the price is set the day you want to buy, you buy and that's it. There's there's no wasted time. Exactly. Like you literally can do it on your phone. You can you know you do it overseas. Um, you can stick to it to a really high performing um, portfolio portfolio strategy or investment strategy with very to uh, little no effort, little effort involved. It's um it's yeah definitely a huge positive for that style of investing. Absolutely, but I, I think um. I think a lot of people, especially property people, and I was like this myself, like they're just 
we just hyped the share market, and I think it's it's uh, Peter Thornhill will call it ignorance, but um, some people I think it's just just the fear of the unknown, and they see the scary headlines, and they see oh this went up today, and this went down today, and they think oh what the fuck how does how does that work you know well, why has it done that yeah for sure and because they don't understand it and they only there's only bad things associated with it you know there's there's no good things it's just it's assumed that it's some kind of some kind of crazy casino and you know yep. you either buy these mining stocks and try and get rich from it there's there's not very little awareness of the slow and steady passive income stream approach yep i couldn't agree anymore and you know i can't really blame them that much because unless you go looking for it all you have to do is think about property prices in australia in the last you know 50 years and you think about the share market with the GFC, especially in 2008, and they're hearing all these horror stories of, um, you know, people in the States <laughs> losing their pension money and stuff like that. I can't blame them too much, but once you dig yeah. deeper and look bit, um, below the, the surface and see that, no, there is actually um, a very well-backed investment strategy for the share market um, that opens your eyes up a bit. Yeah, I mean, the GFC was obviously a big event, but I, I know some shares guys who um, say that that was, had a massive effect on speeding up their wealth creation because they were able to buy these companies or buy these um, index funds or, or listed investment companies that were trading at super cheap prices on really great yields and it just just amplified their returns from then on. Yeah, that's you know, kudos to them to have the the mental strength to to um you know go through that. Um, and I think I'd like to think if I was in a similar situation, I would look at that event as it's a fire sale <laughs> for shares and buy buy yeah. everything cheap. But you never know until you go through it, until you actually see your portfolio halve in value or even worse. You know, um, you never know what you're gonna do. But um. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know. no, no pun intended there, fire sale. The fire sale, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but, did, so, sorry, continue. I was just going to say another thing. Another thing I think um, with the property and shares is that the approach that we're following here with the income stream and the dividends, it's, it's all actually, you don't have to do anything. It's all actually really boring. And I think that's that's what's kind of off-putting to, to young people. And I know I, I would have thought it was, extremely boring and I'm not going to follow that. I want to get rich, you know. I'm not going to get rich with this piddly dividend each year. I know I need to borrow some money and, you know, go and buy a half a million dollar asset and get rich that way. So I think I think it's part to do with how young people are wired, wired for risk. So I think that until you get a little bit older and see things a bit differently and you learn a bit more, you start saying, all right, maybe this boring approach is, uh, with this income stream is not too bad after all. Could, could not agree anymore. I was the exact same. I'm like, I have to do something outside <laughs> the box. That, you know, this this strategy that um, a lot of people are recommending that can't be like it's too easy. It's it's it needs to be more complicated and it needs to be harder <laughs> for it to to really where the big bucks are is where you know. Yeah, I definitely thought like that as well when I was younger. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, cool. So, did you end up um? Selling some properties off investment properties to to pump more money into the um, the share market. Yeah. So what happened was we started investing in 2015 into into shares and started collecting these dividends and and realizing that that was going to be the income stream for us in the future. So we sold a property uh, last year to um, to generate quite a bit of free cash to invest in the share market and also to have cash in the bank sort of for us to live on as we're building up our shares as well because obviously we'd only invested for a couple of, well, a couple of years before we retired into shares so the income stream wasn't large enough to sustain us obviously. So we used part of the money from the property sale to live on and part of it to invest in shares every month so that income stream gets larger and larger over time. And last year, no, sorry, yeah, last year now, we're in 2018, mm. yeah, last year, we we sold it a second property and basically did the same thing. We put a bit of a lump into the share market and we also drip feed some more into it each month and we used some of the money to live on as well. So I plan to just do this for the next probably, depends what happens, but probably like 10 years. So the plan is to sell off the properties slowly 
to minimise capital gains tax and also to try and sell off at opportune times in, in certain markets. So we decided to sell our Sydney property last year nice. and the year before that was one of our Melbourne properties. So our Perth properties will probably be the last to go because it will probably be going through its growth cycle maybe, I don't know, sometime over the next 10 years you would say. Yep. So they'll probably be the last to go. So we're just trying to do that and, and sort of time it a bit and optimize the outcome. Yeah, nice. Now that's such a such a um, cool story, you know, for from uh, an eighteen year old going to WA and getting getting this job and then buying these properties, um, discovering um, the share market and you know what you're doing now with the selling off the properties. Awesome stuff. Um, do we want to? Do you just want to touch on a little bit more about when you actually found out you were financially independent? <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of one of those things that hits you. It was, uh, uh, what was it? I was reading, cause I started after, after about 20, I don't know, 2014 or so, I started reading lots of, lots of financial independence stuff that I could, that I could find, like Mr. Money Mustache and blogs like that. Guys who had, um, who had done it or almost done it. And so I started learning a fair bit about them and how they live and how they invest and stuff like that. Um, so around the same time, obviously we were learning about shares and our income stream that we were, we were planning to have in the future. And after we realized how much income we could actually generate from your, from your money or from your savings, uh, if it was invested in shares, we started looking at, um, what happens if we, if we decided to sell all our properties or sell some or, and we started realizing, holy shit, like this, we've actually got enough to retire. We, we didn't even realize. We thought, oh no, we're going to need like a couple of million dollars in properties. And then we were planning to do a partly living off equity strategy that I mentioned before with just slightly increasing your loans or something to live on. So we started realizing, well, holy shit, we actually have enough now. So then it became a choice of, well, what do we do? Do we, do we keep the properties? Do we, do we keep doing this strategy and just wait until we've got lots, lots more equity or do we retire now? Because we started, started realizing, well, we can, but should we or should we wait till we have more or what should we do? Because we're learning about shares, so we're not quite sure. But then as it became more clear that that was going to be a reliable strategy and a reliable income, we started realizing, well, we actually have, we actually have more than enough if all our, all our capital was actually in shares, so we sort of looked, started looking at each other like, "Are we going to do it?" Or that means we have to sell properties. And you start thinking like, "Well, that's against the law in, in property land. You don't sell properties." Mm-hmm. So <laughs> we start thinking, "Does that mean we're losers? Does that mean we, we, our strategy was wrong? Does that mean you know?" We start, all these things start going through your mind. You start thinking, "Well." We could go for more money and if we held all our properties and worked for the next five or ten years like we were probably planning to work for at least another few years, maybe five years, then we could have maybe, I don't know, a few million dollars of, of equity. But um, if we retire now, then we actually have enough for us to live on and live the life that we like which is a pretty simple life, but it's enough for us. And so we started questioning, well, what's the point of working for another five or ten years? So we just looked at each other, are we going to do it? Are we going to sell one or sell all of them? We thought, and then we just decided, yeah, I think let, let's do it. Let's, let's sell one. So we just decided to to start the process okay. and it went from there. Wow, incredible. So um, how hard of a decision was it to – decide not to go back to work because i know a lot of people would get to that position and think to themselves well we've reached financial independent awesome party but if we just work another couple <laughs> of years we could live like rock stars you know how, yeah. how difficult was that uh man it's weird because you think if you, once you realize it you start thinking about it every day we start looking at each other what are we going to do we're we gonna we're we gonna quit and we're we gonna we're we gonna keep working like how much do we need? Do we do we want more? Or you know, your mind's sort of racing all the time. And then when I'm at work, I'm thinking, "Wow, I actually don't have to be here. Do I like this job or not? What what do I do?" You know. So 
eventually we, we eventually realized that well what, what we have is enough for us and although we we got told we got it sort of advised by one of our the property guys that we work with that we sh- if you know if you stick at it for another five or ten years you'll have you'll have this much equity and we're thinking yeah that's nice but uh we don't really need it so we'd, i'd rather have my life back thanks mm. so it sort of just went from there like oh yeah it's it's enough for us and we're happy and we, we just want our lives back and we can we can always make more money later you know if we if we decide we want to go back to work we can and we can always we can always make more money and buy more properties and do whatever later but Right now, we just want to get our freedom and get our lives back and go from there. Yeah, nice. And that, that's one that I think, you know, sometimes people um, mention the 4% rule um, on the forums and stuff. Mm-hmm. And for those who don't know, it's this um, uh, it's a US study that basically says if whatever your portfolio portfolio is, you should be able to live off 4% of it, roughly. So if you got a million bucks, mm-hmm. you should be able to live off um, and you only spend 40 grand a year, then you're financially independent forever because it, it it factors in inflation and stuff like that but uh, you know all these arguments happen about like well you know what happens if you run out yada yada it's like i can always go back to work shit we're only you know we're turning 30 soon and like yeah, like yeah. it the worst case scenario you go back to work one or two days a week and instantly you've topped up the money that you need to you know get, get through life it's it's a it's a pretty um good problem you know, to to be in if if that's all you need to do. So uh exactly, I exactly I think that uh, when some people I, I sort of see some people doing these calculations. Oh, you know, what if this happens? I'm going to work on a two percent withdrawal rate. Oh, I know. You know what yep. if this happens? <laughs> oh, and I was just start thinking, but they just forget that. Like, you know, why don't you just build some flexibility into that plan? Like, yeah, sure, maybe something bad happens in the share market or whatever, but you can always. Get a part-time job, or you can spend less, or you Absolutely. can r- rent out a rent out a room in your house, or you can. There's like a million things you can yeah, do. Exactly. You're not like set in stone, and you just have to sit at home. Oh no! Oh no! Yeah. What are we gonna it's do? like I'm stuck. I can't do anything. I only factored in the three percent rule. <laughs> no flexibility. <yeah. laughs> it's like, man, I'll go work at Coles. I'll go back to work at Coles for two days a week. Who cares? You know, that's the worst exactly. case scenario we're talking about here. And I've yet to hear it's- one blogger, not one. That said that, um, their portfolio didn't work out, you know, and, or just on that, that they actually stopped earning money once they re- reached financial independent, independence. All, yeah, all of them say they earn, that's the point. they earn more money in, like, in their free time because they're doing stuff they love. That's the point. It's not like, uh, you set this date and then that's it forever. You're not allowed to do anything. You just have to, uh, re- retire on this portfolio, whether it goes up or down and you're not allowed to work, you're mm, not allowed mm. to start a business or, it's just weird. I don't understand it because once you, when you actually retire, you, you you might relax for a few months, but then you're going to be like, oh, what can I do now? It's, you know? it's human nature. Not going to be, you're not like, oh, I have, like a panic, panic like, oh, I have to go back to work. You'll be thinking, oh, what can I do? It's more sort of exciting and sort of empowering. Like, well, I can actually do anything really. So let's just uh, have a think about what I might like to do. Absolutely, Could, couldn't agree anymore. So I'm guessing it was very liberating though um, when you guys decided to that you you were going to um, pack up and um, be financially independent and like move on and do something else. It was, yeah, it was strangely strangely exciting. Yeah, I could, like I could this, say that. Just this strange feeling, yeah. Especially since it was so sudden, it wasn't like a yeah, like right. We knew where the finish line. Yeah. I was like, holy shit, we're actually there now. What, you know, it was like a. Yeah, it was it was probably more strange because it was like that. Yeah, for sure. For this, you weren't like working up to a number, and when you got the number, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, it, so when you you decided that that's what you're going to do, um, you're sticking around WA. Did you do any plans to move back to Victoria or anything like that? Nah, this is home now. I've been here for nearly what is it? It's nearly eleven years, so I'm I'm happy. So, so we're staying here. Yep. And what about um kitties? Is there any kitties on the scene or plans for that? Nah, no kids, no kids, no plans for kids either. We've got a dog and he keeps us busy enough. He's pretty full. Ah, uh, right, right, <laughs> right. Cool. Um, so now I just want to get into um very quickly. Uh, you've got so, some great articles on your blog, and one of them is your um, and we've touched on a little bit your investing strategies in dividend um focused. 
uh, shares. So do you just want to go into that? Mm -hmm. So what do you actually invest in in the share market? So we have some individual stocks, but most of our investment is in listed investment companies, most of which have been around for between 50 and 80 years, so longer than even longer than Vanguard. So they're just pretty boring, slow and steady type investments. So they'll, they're managed by an investment team and they'll usually, these older versions, they own a portfolio of roughly 100 different stocks, some of which will have high yields and probably low growth and some of them will have low yields but high growth. So the balance is that you get a pretty decent income which should grow over time with inflation or a bit faster. And they've uh, they've had pretty attractive returns over the decades and most of their shareholder base is uh, usually retirees who want the dependable income stream because they invest with a dividend focus. So they're all about looking for stocks and companies that can provide a steady income stream and increase their dividends over time, which they can then pass on to shareholders. Yep. And for those who don't know, because I talk about a lot of about ETFs um, uh, <clears throat> on my site and on this um, podcast, so do you just want to quickly give a brief overview of what actually a listed investment, investment company is? Yeah, so it's just like it sounds. It's an investment company that is listed on the stock exchange. So you just you can go onto your share broking account and you can buy shares in a listed investment company just like you could buy shares in Commonwealth Bank or like you buy a parcel of your ETF. It's just basically the same thing. Only it's uh it's a managed it's a managed fund basically that's listed on the share market. And most of them, the the ones that I invest in, are super low fees, so roughly the same as a as a Vanguard ETF, with a and they invest with a super long term focus. Yep. And so, from my understanding, I don't um I don't have any um licks in my portfolio, but it's very very similar for those who don't know. Like the Vanguard ETFs will have a whole bunch of uh, different individual stocks that make up the ETF. So if you buy um a thousand dollars worth of an ETF, you you're buying uh, you know, 2% of this company, 2% of this company, 1% of that company, yada, 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 all the way up to 100%. And listing investment companies, very, very similar. It's almost the same thing. And I want to make a point as well that some listed investment companies might not have super low fees, but the ones that I've looked at, like the, um, the AFI ones and the, um, uh, I forget the other one's name, but it's, it's very, similar to what Vanguard offers, super, super low fees. I actually think it's the same um, if you compare the uh, the VAS Vanguard to AFI. I think it's 0.14% uh, or something like that, management fee. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, they're, they're much of a muchness um, and the returns are very similar as well. I've had a look at the, um, you know, past performance of um, and I, I've just looked at the VAS versus AFI before, and they're very, very similar. Mm-hmm. Um, one attractive thing as yep. well that I've seen a lot of people comment about the Licks is the 100% um, franking credits that they offer, which is mm-hmm. very nice as well. Um, so it is very, mm-hmm. very, very, very similar, these ETS and the listed investment companies. Yeah, they're definitely not all equal. There's some, some of the newer breed style ones that, especially ones that invest in small and medium companies, they often have uh, a lot higher fees. So you should be yeah. be careful there and do your own research. Definitely. They're definitely not all equal, but yeah. these these old style ones with the super low fees are very similar, and they they do perform similar to the market as a whole over time. Yeah. Just that they focus more on holding a a big portfolio of dividend stocks and and providing that reliable dividend income to shareholders. Yep. Yeah, nice. And um. You only invest, or you guys only invest in Australian licks. Do you have any international exposure? No, not at this stage. That's more of a long-term goal for us. It's not really a short-term goal. Okay. But at, at some stage, yes, we do plan to. So what was the thinking behind that? Now, I understand that Australian shares have a, an advantage over international for income because of the franking credits. Um, was that sort of the thinking behind just, just, just going 100% Australian? Well, yeah, it's, it's purely an income thing. I mean, we we could invest overseas and get maybe a 2% yield and have 
uh, 5% growth or something, but I'd rather invest here and get a, say, a 5% yield and 2 or 3% growth, you know? So it's just, uh, it just suits our requirements a lot better. But we do plan to add international later just for some, some further diversification. Yep. And does the, the does the um, concept of a, an Australian recession scare you guys at all? Uh, so that's the thing. You, if you're invested in maybe just Australia, you want to, you need to have some kind of a, a cushion, you know. So in an, in a recession, it's very likely that dividends will get reduced if that's what you're relying on for your portfolio. But since we're not relying on the actual value of our portfolio to draw down against, it's a bit different because dividends tend to be a lot more stable. So in a recession, they drop a lot less than the value of the portfolio will. So during the GFC, the market went down by maybe 50% or 55%. I think dividends as a whole went down by like 20% or something like that. Um, and some listed investment companies, they even were able to keep their dividends the same. So the end shareholder didn't receive a reduction at all in their dividends. So that might not happen all the time, but because of the way the company is structured, these, these LICs, a lot of the time, they can actually smooth out those dividends. So it protects the shareholder to a sense. But the shareholders like us, we um, do have a cash buffer as well to, to smooth out the dividends further should they be reduced. So obviously our income would be reduced in a recession. So the plan is that you just use this cash buffer to top up your dividends if they are reduced in uh, in uh, tough times. Fair enough. Sounds sounds like a sounds like you've you've thought about it uh, well, and I definitely agree. You know, having that cash buffer buffer there in place. That if an Australian recession hit, um, <clears throat> obviously uh, an Australian, a hundred percent Australian portfolio would be affected a lot more than a diversified international portfolio. But if you had that cash buffer and you didn't have to sell shares at a reduced price, because that's the worst thing you can do, unless you really need to do it. Yeah. But it's the worst thing you can do is if during a crash, if you need to sell at that reduced price, that's you know you you you're basically buying high and selling low. Um, so yeah, if you draw down on that cash and you, you you can get through that tough time, and then when it bounces back, you'll be you'll be back in business. And that's exactly why we're not um, we're not sort of following the drawdown approach. I mean, I, I just prefer the income stream focus, and if the market goes down, we don't really have to look at it. We only care what our what our dividends do. So if our dividends drop, then yeah, we'll be concerned and we'll chip into the cash buffer, but we we don't. You don't concern ourselves with with market drops, and you sort of protect your you protect your emotions to to a certain degree there. And emotions are pretty powerful, especially yep. when you uh, think you're losing money. So that that's what helps us keep focused on on our approach. And I just would not feel comfortable, especially having to sell shares in in a recession and stuff like that. It's, it's just not something that that I'll feel comfortable with. But I know some people that's that's fine for them, and they just take it as part of the part of the strategy and they've got their own backup plans but that's uh, that's not for me fair enough um how about we just uh chat about your blog just quickly now so um why don't you tell the audience just a bit about your blog and um wh- when it started and why why you started it yeah so i started it last year sometime i think it was around april or so so pretty much just after i, I stopped work and the idea was just to just to share things that that I learned along the way because some of the things I learned that we've talked about today, I didn't necessarily realize or maybe want to realize <laughs> when I was, uh, when I was at the start of my journey and on my journey. So I just want to share the things I've learned and hopefully help some people who might be not sure about which approach to take and, and just share, share why I like this dividend approach and why I think it's pretty helpful, especially for Financial independence in Australia, and combining it with with hardcore saving, how you can can reach early retirement quite quickly, uh, doing it that way. Yeah, right. And I can I've definitely um you know read a whole bunch of articles on your blog. Uh, just the name is, and I'll put it in the show notes. Well, it's www.strongmoneyaustralia.com. Uh, definitely check it out. Some really cool articles on there. Um, is that probably the best place for people to contact you as well? Yeah, people can just jump on the blog and send me a send me a comment, or there's a contact page there. They can they can get in touch with me that way. Yeah, right. Cool. Um, 
Awesome. Oh, yeah, definitely put put a link in the show notes. Uh, I reckon that is about um, all the questions I had. Did you? Was there anything else you wanted to chat about, Dave, before we wrap this up? No, I think that's pretty much it, mate. Uh, one one last thing I will I will say if you were yeah. um, if you had one bit of advice you, you wanted to give someone trying to reach financial independence today what would it be? It would be to question everything like question all your expenses question where you live and why you live there question the car you drive question the people you hang out with because uh, they might be sort of dragging you down instead of helping you get to where you want to be. You should just be be open to new information and keep keep learning because if you if you don't keep learning you you might miss some pretty critical knowledge or some pretty critical information that'll that'll help you on your path because uh that's what happened to me. I, I tried to keep my mind open and be um be willing to uh explore new strategies and change my approach if I needed to and that's that's really helped me out. So I reckon that's that's what people should um, should keep in mind. Great stuff, Dave. Congratulations for uh, reaching financial independence at such a young age. It was an absolute pleasure, and thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks a lot, mate. Good to talk to you. What a great chat with a great bloke, Dave, uh, aka Strong Money Australia. Um, if you haven't checked out the blog as well, definitely make sure you check it out. I think Dave is one of the best content creators for um, the fire space in Australia. He has some really good articles about um, growth dividend investing and stuff like international shares and Australian shares and you know how much you should allocate and stuff like that. I read everything he um, writes and I learn a lot, so definitely make sure you check it out. It's strongmoneyaustralia.com. Uh, as always, if you enjoy these podcasts and want me to make more, Make sure you drop me a comment and rating on iTunes. Um, and speaking of which, we've got a few new comments and ratings, which I'm going to give a shout out to now. Um, we've got John Triple Seven writes super educational five star, great listen. One of the one of Australia's best finance podcasts. Look forward to every episode. Thank you, John. We've got uh, Al. I think six eight one nine. Keep up the great work. Five star. Hey, mate, it's awesome to hear a podcast from someone looking at fire topics from an Australian perspective. Really appreciate your efforts. Like one of the other users mentioned, some episodes delving into Australian tax-specific laws will be so helpful. Maybe looking at different scenarios listeners may find themselves in on the road to fire. Homeowners at various stages of repayments, earners from a variety of pay brackets, range of investments and important steps they can take to reduce the percentage tax per dollar in each case. I know there is plenty of information on this out there and financial advisors, um, but my trust in them is at an all-time low after the recent commission findings. But it is so difficult to understand, especially in my case coming from a financially illiterate upbringing. People like yourself putting it into layman's terms and offering real actionable advice is invaluable. Keep up the great work. Looking forward to the next episode. Cheers, Al. Thanks a lot, Al. Um, these these episodes are definitely coming. Um, it just takes me a bit of time to, to make them and research them and stuff like that. So uh, it's they're coming. I'm hearing you guys. Um, I've got a few in the works already. Um, so yeah, just keep an eye out. They are definitely on the horizon. And last comment, we've got uh, totally happy. Uh, get on it. Five stars. Have been aware of Aussie Firebug for a while now, but only picked up the podcast this year. Do yourself a favor and give it a listen. Matt has a very relaxed Australian take on personal finance and is definitely a different voice on the scene, which is always nice. Diversify your assets and your media consumption, folks. Thanks a lot. Totally happy. Um, Much appreciated. Uh, So also, um, as always, I'm on SoundCloud, www.soundcloud.com slash Aussie-Firebug. As always, a transcription um, and show notes of this episode can be found on my website www.aussiefirebug.com um thanks a lot guys and i'll see you in the next episode hey guys uh dave actually messaged me after this podcast um just saying he wanted to add in one other thing and uh that's basically just make sure you question your investment strategy um is it really going to play out the way you think 
Uh, your property is going to be enough income after bills are all paid. Do you feel comfortable selling your shares to create income in a market crash? Um, one day it's just going to be you and your investment. So you've got to be super comfortable with how you're generating your passive income stream. And until next time, I'll see you on the next episode. Thanks guys for listening to another episode of the Aussie Firebug podcast. For links to all of the resources plus an entire transcript of this episode, head over to aussiefirebug.com. Make sure you never miss out on another episode by subscribing now on iTunes or SoundCloud.